Since no gun-type assembly had been detonated since the Hiroshima bomb, the weapons development scientists had on this shot their first opportunity to study the nucleonic behavior and fireball configuration of such a device. Atomic Annie is probably one of the strongest, if not the strongest, artillery pieces of all time. Matched up against things like the Gustav Cannon, the Morser, and you know any other atomic artillery pieces you can think of, I, I think ultimately it's going to be on top. It's 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 definitely going to be the coolest out of them, if not like I said, the strongest. With 288 millimeters, it's it's pretty big, even if you compare it to like especially if you compare it to tanks and artillery pieces and mortars, it's not something you just mess around with and the, the kind of gunpowder that gets thrown into the charges they're pretty big too and so we're not necessarily messing around with a small fish here atomic annie is the type of artillery piece to show the boys what's going down and that's kind of what it was built for like many weapons at the time like the davy crockett and the mark 65 atomic rifle it was designed to kind of give the Soviets a bit of a what for, a bit of a callback, you know, let them know that we're not messing around and that if it's going to be an all out war, we're calling the shots, okay? We're going to bring it to them and they're not going to regret it, you know? We're going to give them a fair fight, we're going to give them a real show, kind of thing. And so when the Atomic Annie was being created, that was kind of the idea, you know? If a nuclear exchange was going to happen, we we're going to be on the forefront. We're going to be blasting them and we're going to be showing them. Or should it be that nuclear arms combat is standardized and normalized and the UN's like chill with that then yeah having a nuclear powered or my apologies nuclear equipped artillery piece is sort of viable and seems like a good idea because atomic arms have definitely proved themselves to be very strong and very useful if not you know viable considering that uranium is very you know if you know where to find it there's plenty of it around and if you use only a little bit, you can create very strong reactions. And that's proven by the even weak and not very modern, but at least by today's standards, the little boy and fat man, you know, nuclear bombs. It's a pretty fair thing, you know. If the, the Soviets decide to do it, then the U.S. can do it too. But then it raises the idea of, well, was the atomic anti really ever even used? And th that's kind of the thing. It, it, it really wasn't, to be honest. It was retired, decommissioned, and it was sort of just an idea. It was to prove a point, to say that, you know, we can come up with our own things, we can have our own super weapons, and you guys can do whatever you guys do. And so, we'll be prepared, we'll be ready, we'll be able to uh, give it to you should it be needed. And really, it's not even that, like, it didn't, it couldn't be used, sort of thing, because there was plenty of opportunities to use it, Vietnam, the Korean War, I mean, heck, even the Afghan war, or the Gulf War, you could have thrown it in there, should it be kept around, because it was only really tested in the 60s, even though it was built in the 50s, so, it's not that it wasn't around, and there was many variants made, or I say variants, but really just other versions of the 288, and it was kind of a, a compact thing, you didn't really need other vehicles, you didn't need universal carriers, you didn't need really anything to help it out. It was already designed with, you know, trucks in mind and a carrying system, and while it wasn't exactly the fastest, nor was it the most well-protected, it was serviceable. And that's all it really needed to be, because it was capable of engaging targets up to 20 miles away, so you didn't necessarily need to be up on the forefront getting ready to get blasted by Soviet infantry and armor, because, like I said, you're 20 miles away firing nuclear rounds, and they're not going to be exactly touching up on you, unless you allow that to happen. I mean, there's no way of, you know, preventing covert operations with an artillery piece, right? And so, it's not like it, it wasn't super impractical. I mean, obviously, nowadays, and just thinking about it with the uh, nostalgia goggles off, using nuclear arms in combat is not only kind of immoral, but just not really the best idea. You know, uranium radiation that kind of uh, sucks, to be honest, and producing it is not as easy as producing normal ammunition and, and a munitions factory and then carrying that stuff around it's not exactly the lightest thing and you're not going to be storing it in plentiful amounts you're not an aircraft carrier or a warship of any kind because if you know what you know battleship rounds look like the munitions and the charges that go with them like that's not too far off what the atomic ante was firing the entire barrel of the thing is 14 feet and the crew is like six 
and that's a fair amount of guys to be working on something. And if you think about that, it's not like, well, okay, I, I could definitely see us throwing a couple of those into the battlefield. No, more often than not, that'd be sort of a special artillery, special support vehicle. But like I said, not that it wouldn't have a use. There was fire bases in Vietnam, there was fire bases in Korea, I'm sure. There's places you could set the thing up. It had range, it had power, and could even move on its own. Granted, the jungle might not have been the best place for it, considering it wasn't exactly designed for jungle warfare. You know, it's up to you really, really to decide if it was designed for just temperate or if it was just designed to just not be used because it's not exactly the most well-known or well-tested vehicle as far as the shooting it goes. Yeah, it's been tested. As far as it, you know, driving places, yeah, it's been tested. And I mean, it's been fairly well filmed. But it's, besides being used as, you know, a propaganda thing, it hasn't really been, you know, battle-tested, per se. Because it's what it was being used for and what the idea was for, you know, it's not really a scenario that ever came to be or really came to happen. Obviously, we live in a day and age where WMDs, especially nuclear and atomic ones, and hydrogen ones for that matter, are just kind of, you know, not really allowed. You're, you're kind of a, a suck if you use those and kind of a suck if you do those. And so it kind of just sucks because it's just like, okay, well, it's just another Cold War stupidity like the Davy Crockett or the M Mark 65 atomic rifle. Like, yeah, I mean, are, is anybody going to use this? Is this really something we want to be doing? And no, it's just that's just what it comes down to. It wasn't viable in the eyes of combat or really anything. The Soviets weren't really interested, and especially if, you know, 1991 happening, it just became more of a let's not do that scenario. And it sucks because, well, if you look at other things like say tanks, which were you know kind of gonna, there's a thought that they were gonna come you know out of commission and. It's really, in a way, lucky that just MBT survived because other types of tanks, like tank destroyers and uh, SPAAs and whatnot, they're not as popular and common. Really, tanks have stopped the diversification; they've become more of a singularity. You know, like they're like I said, there was a thought they were going to die out because there was, you know, planes, missiles, like like war changes in the military it advances, and there's like like any many things in like life. There's going to be things that are more popular than others, and so obviously. The atomic Annie wasn't one of those things. Using atomic weapons on a sort of, you know, more standardized, more normal basis just didn't happen. And so, really everything was just going against it. It wasn't something that was needed, really. Nobody was saying, let's build an atomic weapon. It was more just like a good idea from the standpoint of the United States. Because obviously there has been proven, you know, larger artillery pieces. I mean, battleships, they worked. They were, they were pretty good. Uh, you know, the Gustav Cannon, it worked for what it was worth. The Paris gun, it worked for what it was worth. Morser, it worked for what it was worth. And if you look at things like the V-1 flying bomb or the V-2 uh, vengeance missiles, right? Like, they worked for what they were worth. And so the idea of having long-range death was kind of a good idea. And especially in a scenario where you're facing total atomic annihilation, I think, you know, having access to many ways of destroying the enemy is a good idea. But... That's really as far as it goes. It was kind of just a, a good wish, a good idea. Like, you know, when they sat down designing the thing, they were like, yeah, you know, if, if we're lucky, we'll, we'll get to fire these at the Reds someday. And obviously, you know, they were a bit too lucky. And that's it. It just kind of, like, died. Like, nobody really cared about it. Because even though there's multiple built, and they, you know, they were functional, and they worked, and, I mean, you could say they even worked well, and they, you could say they even excel at what they do, it, they never really saw a purpose. They never really fit anything. If you know, compared to other artillery pieces of the time, they, you know, they fit the the sort of role you'd want them to be. you'd want them to be fairly mass producible. You want them to be fairly effective, especially in numbers, and you want them to be, you know, fairly portable. Like they have to be, they have to fit the, a certain level of usability. And the atomic Annie just doesn't really have that. It doesn't really fit that scheme, that, that schematic. It fits under the role of the, the like the Gustav cannon. Like it was used a couple times. And when it was used, it, it did its job, but it's kind of a burden, really. And as far as I see it, and as far as, you know, just looking at it from a, like a retrospective, it just seems like a waste of money and a waste of time. You know, where where is this, like, this crazy American nuts, stupid tomfoolery when we need it? 
You know, nowadays we're kind of off the rocker when it comes to artillery combat, and you know, the, the, the Soviets, the, the, the Federation, if you will, they're kind of on top of the game. Granted, like I said, warden military changes, and so aircraft have been more of a thing we focused on. We focus more on our navy. We focus more on, you know, uh, anti-guerrilla and more just, you know, anti-terrorism tactics and investing in other types of weaponry, sort of the thing we've been doing. And so, I guess in a way that rings true to Cold War era United States, but the Atomic Annie isn't an aircraft or a missile or anything like that. It's a, a fairly simple idea modified to a very really modern age, the Atomic Age, if you will. And so, while I may not have ever really become anything of real craziness, you know, aside from being cool, I think it was still a pretty cool artillery piece. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. If you like the Kaboom Week idea, I definitely want to continue doing themed weeks, and I'm definitely going to continue uploading as far as time, you know, will tell. And if you're interested in, you know, watching more of my stuff, there's plenty of it out, and there's plenty of it along the way. So, as always, Hope you have a good day, good tomorrow, good Wednesday, and uh, continue enjoying Kaboomy type things. And that is all. Following total atomic annihilation, it may fall to you to save the great nation. That's why Voltec has made extra preparation and are proud to present to you a special education.